Yes, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to an unforgettable episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And let me tell you, for this week, there have been such a plethora of news that has been going on. Like, it has been just pure madness with all the things that have been revealed. Not just in terms of trailers, but also in terms of news. Like, probably the hardest thing for me to do this week was actually to find out what to go and talk about. And just a little heads up that uh, this week, considering that there have been a lot of things that we have to go and discuss about... Um, there won't be five stories that I shall highlight, but rather six. So, these are going to be some real big ones that a lot of people have been discussing, and I think it will be a great time for me to publicly go and discuss it with you guys. And trust me when I say that this shall be an episode that you won't soon forget. And it's going to get crazy from beginning to end. But before we get things started, there are a couple of stories that I would like to discuss about, and uh, I guess you could say they would be a little bit of an honorable mention. And um, I guess I'll go with a bad news, good news kind of thing. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to go and pay my respects to... Uh, Probably the saddest death that has happened this week, or probably even one of the saddest deaths of this decade, which is uh, the passing of Stan Lee, who has unfortunately passed away at the age of 95 this week. And as you guys probably know, Stan Lee is the legendary creator of Marvel and also the man behind many of some of the most beloved superheroes, including Spider-Man, The Avengers, X-Men, Fantastic Four, and so much more. So I just want to say, may he rest in peace. And also, uh, one more thing <clears throat> I have been practicing. Excelsior! <laughs> so yeah, I thought uh, might as well share that little thing with you guys. And also... On a positive note, however, uh, as I am recording this, November 18th, it is just around the corner. And with that date, I want to go and say happy birthday to the one and only Mickey Mouse, who will, sur who will soon be turning 90. And uh, more specifically, though, it shall be the 90th anniversary of one of the most legendary and most beloved and... Probably what many people would consider one of the greatest cartoons of all time. And of course, I am referring to Steamboat Willie. So with that said, I just want to say happy birthday to Mickey Mouse. And uh, hopefully we will celebrate many more great years with you. So I'm sure we'll be celebrating quite soon uh, at the Disney parks, considering that we did recently receive more information about Mickey's first major attraction, Mickey and Minnie's uh, Runaway Railway, so um, we will soon have an eye out on that at Disney's Hollywood Studios and also at Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland. Alright, so anyways, with all that said and done, now that I have all that out of the way, um, I just want to go and ask you guys, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Because seriously guys, strap yourselves in because we are about to embark on an insane journey. Alright, let me see. Are we all ready? Alright, we seem to have some yeses. Okay. Yes, yes. Alright, good, good, good. We got people that are all ready and set on this. Perfect! So might as well begin this with the plethora of trailers that we have gotten. I don't know what the fridge has happened this week, but somehow we have gotten a whole bunch of trailers that have made some major news and really the kind of trailers that went viral that had everybody talking about. So we might as well go and start things off with our first trailer that we are going to be looking into. And considering that uh, this is a more animation-centric podcast, we're going to start things off with the biggest animated trailer with Toy Story 4. So let's go ahead and check this one out. Uh, hey, hey, somebody get him before he pokes an eye out. So that was our first ever look that we have gotten for Toy Story 4, the fourth installment of uh, the Toy Story franchise, obviously. And honestly, the only thing that I can ask is just, 
That's it? I mean, really? This is all that you're presenting with this? I mean, what the fridge is this? Because honestly, my biggest problem... Okay, okay, first of all, before I continue, I just want to clarify... Okay, technically, yes. This is a teaser trailer, and it's not supposed to go and reveal to us too much about what this movie is going to be about. But still, though, even though there's not much to criticize, I just feel like there really isn't much that it's revealing. They're, they're, it, honestly, it's showing us nothing. Like, the most that it's just telling us is just the fact that the toys are going to be coming back. And the only new thing that they have revealed is just this crazy spork that apparently his name is Forky. And that's pretty much it. Like, that's the only new element that they want to reveal about Toy Story 4. And I, I just want to go and clarify, first of all, that with me, of course, I, I, I might have stated this before in my videos and stuff like that, but yeah, I love the Toy Story franchise. I love the Toy Story trilogy. And especially with the third one, like, that ending, it's not good, it's not great, it's not amazing, it's perfect. Like, it ended off on such a tear-jerking yet perfect moment for the whole Toy Story franchise that Andy decides to give his toys to a little girl and goes off to college, so long par partner, and that's it. It was such a beautiful, perfect ending that honestly, the fact that Pixar would come in and just suddenly say, but wait, there's more. Like, really? And that's honestly the big thing that I want to know about Toy Story 4. Honestly, that's probably the reason why I feel highly critical about this movie in particular. It's just that I really love the three Toy Story movies. It's mainly because out of my love for the Toy Story films that I feel so critical about this one in particular. And I wanted to know, what new can you offer with this? Like, what more do you want to tell us? Other than, like, what you're showing here. Like, the, the, like what, what new can you add that you didn't add already with the other Toy Story films? And honestly, with this one, it shows us nothing. Like, it shows us, yeah, okay, we're gonna see all our favorite toys are back. And honestly, just Forky. And that's pretty much it. I, 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 and I, I, honestly, I just feel like, really? Like, that's it? Because honestly, with this one, with this Toy Story 4 teaser trailer... It's pretty much the equivalent of the Venom teaser trailer. Now, say what you will about Venom. Like, you can love it, you can hate it. But we gotta agree that the teaser trailer, yeah, it kind of sucked. Because it really showed us nothing. This is like the animation equivalent of the Venom teaser trailer. Where it barely showed us anything. It barely tells us anything about what this movie is going to be about. Yeah, of course, this is another Toy Story movie, so... Obviously, we're about to expect the return of many of our favorite characters like Woody, Buzz, Jesse, Ham, Rex, uh, Slinky Dog, Mr. Potato Head, and so much more, of course. But the big question is that Toy Story 4 must answer is, what new are you going to add to the Toy Story franchise that we haven't seen already? And that's my biggest question with this. And this barely answers anything other than like this crazy spork thing, which really, that is not enough to convince me that we need another Toy Story movie. But then, suddenly out of the blue, literally 24 hours later, suddenly Pixar came in with this, a teaser trailer reaction. Now let's go and check this one out. You don't go beyond infinity. You don't know nothing about science. <laughs> okay. So suddenly you release that teaser trailer and then you immediately would come out with this. And honestly, I just feel like, what the fridge? Because after like I first saw this, I was just like downright confused about what Pixar is trying to do with these teaser trailers. Like this, I don't know if this is the first time that this happened that they, like a, a, a legit company would first release a teaser trailer and then release their own reaction to this teaser trailer. And you know the craziest thing about this, like honestly the wildest thing is the fact that this one right here, the reaction to the teaser trailer, 
actually works so much better than the previous one that we have right over here, Toy Story 4. And yeah, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people are mentioning that uh, what you have heard here is actually from two new characters named Ducky and Bunny, which are actually voiced by Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele. And yeah, it is actually kind of surprising that uh, Jordan Peele is back doing some voiceover work or even some acting after that he did state that the Emoji Movie made him quit acting when Sony Animation offered him to do the voice of the poop emoji. But then again, I mean, when you look at it in hindsight, I guess, like, you're about to enter into a Pixar movie. More specifically, you're gonna be in another Toy Story movie. It's hard to really say no to that. I mean, yeah, sure, it's easy for Sony Animation to make you feel turned off about acting in general and makes you want to quit. But when Pixar come in and tells you, hey, we want you to voice a new character in our movie and you're going to enter into the world of Toy Story. You know, it's like, it's kind of easy to break your promise saying that, okay, I think I'll get back to acting this time with this one because I'm going to be in a Toy Story movie. So I don't blame Jordan Peele in this position right over here. But yeah, going back into this one in particular, I feel, yeah, the reaction is so much better than what we got with the original teaser trailer because I don't know if you guys have noticed, like, you look around here. This thing has, ad, ha, th like, this teaser trailer actually does answer the big question for me. What new can you offer other than what we've already gotten in the previous Toy Story movies? And we actually got two of them. Number one is new characters. Yes, in the last one, we have seen a new character with Forky. But he wasn't really that prominent in there. Like, honestly, the other characters, like the recurring characters, got a lot more screen time than Forky. Like, he's just there to say, I'm not a toy! I'm crazy! But in this one right over here, these new characters are a lot more prominent. Like, these ones are about, like, in this teaser trailer, it's about these new characters, Ducky and Bunny. Which is basically Key and Peele entering into the Toy Story world. And I'm not gonna lie, I find this trailer actually pretty hilarious. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised myself. I wouldn't be surprised if I would end up quoting some of these things uh, right over here. Like, to infinity and your mom. Or to insanity and a blonde. <laughs> that could be my motto right over there. <laughs> no, but uh, in all seriousness though... Um, it really does highlight the fact that we are going to get new characters in this Toy Story movie. So that is a major point that they got there. And number two, the second reason why I feel like this teaser trailer works a lot better is actually the setting. It introduces us what new concepts can they deliver in the world of Toy Story. And as you can see around Ducky and Bunny... They are in a carnival setting. Like, they're in one of those little arcade games that you can shoot something and you go and win a prize. Thus, giving us the idea that we are going to see from the perspective of these little prizes. Like, these uh, prizes that you would get in these, carnival, uh, in these carnival games, like plushies and toys and stuff like that. They are going to be coming to life and we're going to see from their perspective. We're going to see how they are going to react and how they feel about being these carnival prizes. So this is actually a pretty cool idea and it's actually a pretty unique idea to see what they can do with it. Honestly, after seeing this with Ducky, Bunny and the carnival setting, it does make me a little bit more optimistic about it. It does give me an idea of what new they could enter in the Toy Story world that they have yet to explore. Not just in the movies, but also uh, in terms of the cartoons, like the little shorts that they would do set after Toy Story 3. So honestly, looking at this, it does make me a little bit more optimistic on how this movie is going to be. Now, I know that... I have been pretty critical about this, especially with the first teaser trailer. And I mean, there is a high possibility that this could actually turn out to be 
a really good movie or even yet um it could actually turn out to be equally as good as the previous toy story films as much as the trilogy and i know like maybe this could add into the argument about oh like which sequel is better two three or maybe even four but honestly i feel like uh, I, I just want to say right now with the argument of uh which is better toy story 2 or toy story 3 really like you can have your opinion on which one you think is better but for me um, like, even though I feel like I really do enjoy Toy Story 3, like, uh, that one is probably my favorite Toy Story sequel, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter because, like, all three movies are absolutely amazing, so th there's not much of a point to really compare. Let's just say that all three of these movies are really, really good and we could just move on. Um, but I will say, yeah, there is a chance that this one could actually turn out to be great as well. And the teaser trailer reaction actually does work out better to show that more so than the first teaser trailer. So honestly, it does leave me a little bit confused about what Pixar is, like, what are they trying to do with this? Like, I don't know what would be the goal. I don't know if they actually did that on purpose. The fact that they showed literally nothing in the first teaser trailer. Like, I, I, I just don't really know. But hopefully, like, in the trailer... Like, obviously, they did release this right now so that later on we would see this in theaters just in time with Ralph Breaks the Internet, which is going to be coming soon. So hopefully we will see this uh, teaser trailer reaction be more prominent than the official teaser tra uh, official teaser trailer because this one works better as a teaser more so than the other one like just make this your official teaser trailer really but yeah honestly this is my thoughts on uh, the teaser of Toy Story 4 maybe it could turn out great maybe it won't but at least uh uh, honestly, at least with this one, uh, I did get a little bit more of an idea of what they're going to do with Toy Story 4. So, with all that said and done, I would like to know into the chat wall right over here, and I want to ask you guys, what do you think about both the teaser trailer and the teaser trailer reaction to Toy Story 4? Are you more optimistic about it? Are you not sure? Do you think there should be a Toy Story 4? Do you think not? Uh, let me know what you think. Holy crap, uh, there's already a lot of people uh, making a freaking wall of text here. So uh, let me just uh, go and pick some. All right. Uh, this movie may be unnecessary and it does, doesn't need to exist, but I love all the Toy Story films. And uh, this one could be like Finding Dory where not many people ask for it, but it could really be good. And I'm trying to stay optimistic. I think uh, Jim Carrey will be replacing Don Rickles as Mr. Potato Head. Well, there's no confirmation of that, so I don't know. Because he died last year, may he rest in peace along with Stan Lee. Okay, yeah, that does bring up a good point that, I mean, technically this is not necessarily the first time that we got an unnecessary sequel. I mean, yeah, sure, like, you can argue, like, Monsters University and the Cars films are rather unnecessary, but with the case of Finding Dory, yeah, that is a sequel that nobody asked for, yet it actually turned out to be really good. Um, that, that could be the same case with uh, Toy Story 4, so you do bring up a good point. Alright, let's see now. Uh, in my opinion, regarding the second Toy Story 4 teaser, I'm rather concerned to say the least. Even at Pixar's worst, I never felt like uh, they casted someone just to try to sell their movie, unlike the other animation studios. They usually cast based off of it, uh, based off they feel someone is right for the part, and if they happen to be famous, cool. However, the fact that they decided to not only cast both Key and Peele, but also an entire teaser tra trailer uh, dedicated to redoing one of their skits just screams to me. I, I get what you mean. I, I do get what you mean because like um, with the case right over here with Ducky and Bunny, yeah, this is Key and Peele just being Key and Peele. And even, um, like, even when you look back at something like Storks, it doesn't necessarily feel like an entire Key and Peele routine. Like this, like over, like in Storks, that one is like Key and Peele being characters, which in this case is a bunch of wolves. But in this one right over here, yeah, it, it does feel like uh, Key and Peele just doing one of their skits, uh, no different than what they would do in their TV show. So uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we got here? Uh, I'm not apologizing for looking forward to this movie. I don't think Pixar would still be going... Whoops, uh, hold on. Uh, to uh, I don't think Pixar would still be going through with this movie uh, if they didn't think it would work. Plus the fact that Hanks and Allen said that this is probably the saddest ending in the history of cinema. 
That is actually true. That's one thing I did forget to mention is actually the fact that um, there have been some recent news going around that uh, Tom Hanks and Tim Allen, they couldn't even stand watching the entirety of Toy Story 4 because, like, the, that ending apparently is way too sad to them. Uh, it, like, it, they would break down and just sobbing. Apparently, like, this is going to have a massively sad ending. Now, Again, it's going to be hard to really beat what we have gotten with Toy Story 3 because we can argue that one is also one of the saddest endings that we have ever seen in cinema history, but we don't know how they're going to top that, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But I think with all that said, we're pretty much all good with uh, this teaser trailer right over here. So uh, we're going to give Toy Story 4 a little bit of a rest uh, until we are going to see another trailer coming from it. Or probably the, the full trailer, which I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to see it when uh, Dumbo would be released in theaters. Which, don't worry guys, I will get to later. But first and foremost, uh, speaking of carnivals, you know, it's fun playing around with the games and stuff like that. But you know... When there's a carnival, usually that would mean that there are also some rides that are offered at the same time. And maybe Pixar is not going to be offering it here. We know Paramount will. Uh, with their next movie that, they, that is going to be coming out, which is going to be called Wonder Park. So let's go ahead and check this trailer out. Three, two, whoops. One, there we go. It's time to open the park. Okay, um, you know, this actually does remind me about last week's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, where you might remember I had a special guest, Ayo Saul, and there was at one point, I remember she mentioned that she brought up Wonder Park as an example about a trailer that it is only functioning as a trailer, that it doesn't necessarily reveal too much, that... It only gives us a little bit of what the movie is going to be about and doesn't necessarily spoil everything. Like, literally summarize the whole movie in one big shot. Well, uh, sorry, Saul. <laughs> Looks like Wonder Park proved you wrong because I feel like we just got the whole movie right over here. Like, it just literally explained everything for us in one big swoop. That apparently, like, I can summarize the whole movie for you right now, that uh, there's this little girl and she always dreamed about making this little theme park called Wonder Park, but then she kind of grew up a little bit and kind of felt like, oh, my dreams are just too stupid. Uh, I need to be a little more realistic. But then suddenly, out of some kind of magic, Wonder Park suddenly comes to life and now she has to go and save the park from chimpan zombies. Which are supposedly, like, rip-offs of, like, the gremlins or, like, whatever evil minions that you would find in stuff like Goosebumps or something like that. I don't know. Okay. Now, I will be positive and I will say that, yeah, this is actually a really good-looking movie. The animation here, um, it, I'm not gonna lie, it is quite stunning. Like, it, it actually does look great from, uh, the, like, you know, the designs are actually pretty cute. Uh, Wonder Park itself looks absolutely phenomenal and uh, just want to see if there's a good if we can get like a good look at it Just see if there is one area. Yeah, like um, Yeah, we just back it up like a lot of it actually does look fantastic So like the little girl is meant to go and save the day from like all the chaos that Wonder Park is kind of spreading because of like these chimpanzee zombies and apparently the darkness apparently that's going to be the main antagonist the darkness really dude it's just i don't know like okay it, it definitely does look great and it definitely does look like it's something that the animators definitely had a lot of fun in terms of crafting but this definitely feels like it's going to be style over substance that obviously they they care more about 
making something that would be like eye candy, something that would be more visually pleasing, more so than paying attention to the writing, because for the most part, it just feels cliched. And that that's my problem, it's just that the script kind of feels a little bit bland, and there's nothing in this trailer here that makes me feel like I want to connect with many of these characters. Like, I don't necessarily care about the little girl, and then, like, she has her ragtag team of animal friends that are mostly meant to be, like, comic reliefs, uh, putting, you know, like, delivering these lame jokes, especially with the porcupine, and then, like, you got the villains, again, with the chimpanzee zombies, you know, honestly, like, you, you just look at them, they, like, tell me that this is meant more to be, like, to sell toys, like, they want to try to really capitalize on the merchandising of Wonder Park, and just go and r really try to make a profit out of like this, oh, check out all the chimpanzee zombies, collect them all, and all that stuff. I don't know. It's just like, there's something about this script in particular that I feel from this trailer that feels a little bit soulless and is more aiming towards the merchandising and really trying to make more of a visual eye candy to focus more on the animation more so than on the writing than on the script to develop a compelling story to make uh, memorable characters. Like, yeah, sure, when people are going to enter this, they will remember Wonder Park. You know, in a way, I guess you could... Rem it does remind me a little bit about Jurassic World, where it does spend a lot more of its time on, the th on developing the theme park itself more so than the story or its characters. Because let's be honest, the dinos like the attractions, like the dinosaurs, and the theme park itself is the only memorable thing about the Jurassic World movies. Do we necessarily care about any of the characters or what's going on with the story? Like, do we really care about the characters like Chris Pratt or Bryce Dallas Howard or any of those people? I feel like it could be the same thing right here, where Wonder Park could be the animation equivalent of Jurassic World, where yeah, it's gonna look great, the animation does look spectacular, and the animators have done a great job from what I can see with this trailer. But honestly, I just don't have much of a feel in terms of its writing, if it's going to be good in terms of a written script, in terms of a story, in terms of its characters. I honestly just don't know. Like, maybe I could be wrong. This could actually turn out to be great, and maybe it's just the trailer itself that is not representing the movie well. But either way, I just don't feel like I'm gelling with this movie. I don't feel as excited for Wonder Park as much as some of the other movies that are going to be coming out in 2019 like How to Train Your Dra like uh, How to Train Your Dragon the Hidden World or even uh, with Toy Story 4 like again the teaser trailer reaction actually works much better than this one here especially when this is just like mostly summarizing what the story is going to be about so yeah I, I don't know about you guys but yeah Wonder Park it just doesn't necessarily work for me Okay, so, with all that said, I would like to know from you guys, what do you think about this trailer of Wonder Park? Are you guys um, excited for this movie? Uh, are you going to go check it out? Are you more excited? Are you more doubtful about it? Do you think it reveals a little too much? Let me know what you think. Alright, um, let me see here. Might not be looking forward to it, despite the animation looking awesome, but the jokes in the trailer do turn me off a little. Uh, but like you said, the trailer is, uh, kind of, uh, oh, kind of did show, uh, the whole movie. Seriously, trailers nowadays give you the whole movie in just two minutes. The animation gives me Disney Pixar vibes. Yeah, that, that is the case. Like, the, yeah, I could definitely tell. Like, the animation, yes, it does look great, but it's just bad, it looks like it might have a bad script, and, like, it does seem like it already has a lot of bad jokes, so, yes, yeah, it seems iffy. I honestly think it looks interesting. It is visually impressive, but might have a weak story, and I don't think it would do well financially because competing... Oh, because of competing with Captain Marvel. Yeah, that yeah, that could definitely be a strong case. I think this one is going to be... Yeah, it's coming out on March 15th, 
And that's going to be a pretty hard time for this movie to actually uh, get audiences going. Especially if it's going to be released at the same time uh, in the month when there's going to be movies like Captain Marvel or even Dumbo. And technically, yes, I know that uh, The Hidden World is going to be released like a few weeks before, almost a month before Wonder Park. But I feel like most people are just going to be spending their money on how to train your dragon, uh, the hidden world, and they're already going to have their animation fill. So when this movie is going to come out, people are going to say no thanks. And if families want to go and check out a movie, they might not go into this, but rather save their money on Dumbo. That's the feeling that I'm going to get. So yeah, there is a strong chance that I can see this as a bit of a financial flop and uh okay i just i don't know about you guys but i think i don't know if it's just me i, I don't know yeah honestly i don't know if it's just me but i feel like i i feel i don't know if it's just me i feel like i found a freddy krueger chimpan zombie like one of these zombies is actually i, I don't know i feel like correct me if i'm wrong like this one right over here like you see a little chimpan like a little chimpan zombie. He looks like he's wearing a fedora and he has like this gray and red sweater. It looks I don't know about you. It, it looks like is this a Freddy Krueger zombie? I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it kind of looks like that. So, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. But uh anyways, I think we are pretty much good with uh this one with uh, Wonder Park. And moving on to our next trailer, speaking of uh, Dumbo, that's actually the next story that we're actually going to be talking about. So let's go ahead and check out Dumbo. Uh, okay, so that was Dumbo. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with this one. Um, I guess you could say... I do have a little bit of similar feelings with this one. It's the same that I have with Wonder Park. Where I'm going to give it this. It definitely does look like a visually pleasing movie. And considering that this is a Tim Burton film, that is always one of his strongest suits. The fact that he can make something that is visually stunning. Something that is visually unique. Um, something Burton-esque, if you will. And, yeah, this definitely does look like it sticks to the Burton style. Especially with the whole, um, you know, with all the swirls and the circus motif. Like, especially, like, right in the mi middle. Like, after a minute of this trailer, you see, like, everybody going into Dreamland. Like, it definitely looks stunning. And even the circus itself actually looks great. And I'm not gonna lie, even the stuff that they have actually adapted from the animated film actually does look great. I'm not gonna lie, Dumbo actually does look pretty good. You know, this is a perfect blend of a real elephant and something that came straight out of the animated film. It, like, you can recognize, yeah, this is, like, this is supposed to be a real-life elephant, even though this is completely CGI, but, yeah, this, like, there's no mistaking that... This is not only Dumbo because of the big ears, but also, like, design-wise, it looks just like what we got in the animated film. This is actually Dumbo, even with the eyes. Like, some people might say it looks a little creepy, but, you know, it actually does look pretty good. And it's not only that, but we do also have a little bit of a snippet of the pink elephants, where everybody is playing around with bubbles, and we do see the pink elephants coming to life you know, making more of these. Now, I don't know if they're just going to make like a little reference to that, if it's just like a throwaway mention, but I don't know. That's probably the one thing that I am excited the most and probably what many people are excited to see. And that is the live action remake of the pink elephants. Like maybe the movie is not going to be much, but at least like we'll get something pretty awesome. And already uh, considering that the movie itself does look visually promising. I think this scene in particular with the pink elephants is definitely going to be the highlight of the whole movie. But let's talk about what is wrong with this trailer. Why do I have some doubts to it? And honestly, we've been hearing about it for so long in this trailer. They've been talking the whole time. It's honestly these freaking kids right over here. The little boy and the little girl interacting with Dumbo. The fact that 
in this trailer, it basically does confirm that these kids are going to be replacing Timothy. And oh god, that is something that I am not excited about because already the kids here are pretty obnoxious. Like, they just feel annoying that they're trying to be a little more cutesy in order to go and help out Dumbo. Like, fly, Dumbo. We know you have great powers. We know you can fly. We're going to go and save your mother. Ah, oh, shut the fridge up. Good God. And it does feel like you do have some hints that they're really going to try to go and expand upon all other aspects that they really want to highlight many other characters including Colin Farrell and then you also got Danny DeVito playing as the ring you know playing the good guy ringleader basically reprising his role from what he already played in Big Fish except hopefully in this one we're not going to see him naked and we're going to get a good shot of his butt you know, that actually did happen on Big Fish, by the way. If you want a scene where you want a naked Danny DeVito, go and check out Big Fish. <laughs> you, you know there's going to be someone out there who would actually want that. But you know what is actually the worst thing? Why I already don't like these kids already is the fact that in this trailer, it really does tease you about the fact that, yeah, these are the replacements of Timothy Mouse. And if you don't believe me, it's actually right at the beginning where you see like the little girl, like you see the kids, they're coming in to see, uh, they, they're going to come in and see Dumbo. They have this little, they, they have this little cage. It has some mice and look at one of them. Hold on. Look at this guy. You got this one little mouse dressed up as a ringleader. That's freaking Timothy. That is Timothy Mouse right over there. That is a promise that Timothy Mouse will actually be in this movie. But no, it looks like, according to this trailer, it's just going to be a little freaking cameo because these little kids are going to be taking his freaking place. And that honestly just pisses me off so much. <laughs> oh my god, like why do we have just obnoxious kids replacing Timothy Mouse? Good god, what the fridge? <laughs> oh man, I, honestly, I just don't know. And like, honestly... I feel like with this trailer, it tells me that there is no way in hell the fact that this is going to be anywhere in the levels of the original 1941 movie. There is no way. But I will give it that, you know, it does look visually pleasing. It's not going to necessarily be bad. It does look like it will be a visual spectacle in a sense. And considering that this is from Tim Burton, we might get something that might be in the veins of something like his Alice in Wonderland movie. Where yeah, there's going to be a lot of visual components that are going to look great. It's just written wise with its script and stuff like that. It's not going to be all that much worth it. And especially like it did mention right at the end. Yeah, the screenplay is going to be from Ethren Kruger. And directed by Tim Burton. Now, not not to say that Kruger is a bad person at all. I'm sure he's a nice guy. It's just the stuff that he has written, like with the Transformers movies. I don't know. I don't have that much faith that this guy is going to be responsible to bring Dumbo some new life with a brand new remake. I don't know, man. It's just... Uh, I don't know. You can be a good writer, but... This is not necessarily something that would fit in your qualification. I'm just saying. So yeah, honestly, I don't know. This one, this one, I just really have some mixed feelings with it. It's a little similar to Wonder Park. Yeah, it's going to look great, but I don't know if this is going to be a great movie. So yeah, I'm not all that excited to see. Yeah, I'm not excited to go and check out uh, Dreamland and stuff like that. So, I don't know. So, with all that said and done, I would like to know, uh, what do you guys think about this trailer of the live-action remake of Dumbo? Are you guys excited for it? Are you guys actually optimistic? Do you want to go and check out this movie? And, uh, are you also doubtful about it? Are you not interested? Let me know what you think right over here. Okay, so, uh, it says, 
The film does feature some promise, but many of the changes, uh, particularly the kids taking Timothy Mouse's place, being implemented really do hold it back. Plus, considering the Ringling Brothers circus shut down a couple of years ago, seeing animals uh, partaking in circuses could seem a little bittersweet for some people. Um, actually, you know what's interesting to note about that is that I am sure that in this one in particular, in this, uh, in this movie, like, I'm sure there might be some form of animal commentary, rather it be like animal abuse or anti-circus. I'm sure that's actually going to be something that they will bring up, that the like having animals in circuses is not necessarily okay. That I, I, I'm pretty sure that they're going to do, considering that Disney is trying to also be really progressive, and sometimes it doesn't work necessarily as well. Case in point, look at the Alice in Wonderland movies and look at Maleficent. So yeah, I'm sure they're going to try to do something with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dumbo may actually be good. For me, I did like the 2010 version of Alice, and I am always an easygoing guy on movies that people are sometimes mixed about. As a visual effects student, the visuals are spectacular since it is coming from the same team who did The Jungle Book 2016, so I'm looking forward to this soon. However, Aladdin and Lion King are the main Disney live-action films I'm looking out for. Okay, so that is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the film does feature some promise, but many of the... Oh, no, I already read that one. What the fridge am I doing? <laughs> All right, hold, hold on, let me see. I'm honestly more excited to see Michael Keaton and Danny DeVito together again since Batman Returns. Uh, maybe these guys could save this movie, by the way. Uh, can you make a Batman joke on this? Oh, I didn't think of that, actually. That is a very good point, because this is actually a major reunion of Michael Keaton, Tim Burton, and Danny DeVito all coming together in one movie. Uh, that does actually bring up a very good point. In fact, like, I guess you could say, in a way, like, you look at Danny DeVito with the way that he's dressed up, I mean, it's not, yeah, like, right over here, it's not all that different to how he was dressed up as the Penguin anyways. And I mean, like, yeah, with Batman, he is also Bruce Wayne. So, yeah, in here, like, what you see Michael Keaton right over here. He doesn't look all that different from how he was as Bruce Wayne in the Batman movies. Or, I mean, granted, like, maybe it's more of a combination of Bruce Wayne and uh, the founder, you know, that McDonald's movie. So maybe it's a combination of the two. So you do bring up a very good point that... Maybe with Danny DeVito and Michael Keaton, they will provide some entertaining, um, you know, they, they will bring in some entertaining performances. But in terms of what we got here, in terms of what they can do with, uh, with Dumbo, I don't know. It's just like they'll, br they'll do something good with the execution, but written wise, it is something that I am highly concerned about. Okay, so, uh, I think we're pretty much going to be good with, uh, this one, I think we're good with Dumbo. And now we have one more trailer that we are going to look at. And I saved probably the best one for last. The one that got the most viral. The one that people got the most talking about. And this is going to be a bit of a bonus miscellaneous because this isn't necessarily something that is connected with animation. Maybe a little bit. But, um, you'll see. This is something that, for me, as a Pokemon fan myself, I gotta talk about this. So, let's go ahead and talk about Detective Pikachu. So, that was the trailer for Detective Pikachu. And honestly, honestly, like, with this kind of idea right over here, this would seem like the kind of movie that I would hate. This would seem like the kind of movie that things can go absolutely wrong. The kind of film that would be in the veins of like the Alvin and the Chipmunk films or Yogi Bear or Scooby-Doo or the Smurfs or stuff like that, that they're really trying to modernize uh, an animated property and using ugly looking CGI, trying to make it realistic in order to make the character, you know, in order to bring this thing to life. You know, it seems like something I would hate. But here's the thing. I look at this. I don't hate this. Funny enough, even as a major Pokemon fan, I don't hate this. There's something that I see this and I'm like, I want to see this. Funny enough. And I think the real big thing to go and highlight is really 
in terms of the visuals. And I'm surprised to say that, yeah, this actually really looks good. Like, even the Pokemon themselves, they're, they actually look great. And they look respectable to the original designs. And I mean, like, a great example. Like, let, let's get to Pikachu right over here. No, you can't understand Here, like, we'll, we'll just Put advance a little bit. Or I... Yeah, like... If you look at Pikachu, like, they stayed very true to the original design. It's just adding in a little bit of textures. And may I, may I add, with this Pikachu right over here, like, holy freaking crap. This is the fluffiest Pikachu that I have ever seen. Like, holy crap, he is, like, honestly, the only thing that's going on in my head is, like, Agnes from the Despicable Me films. Like, he's so fluffy, I'm gonna die! Like, you just want to hold him up and go, he's so fluffy! Oh my god. Like, the, the, the funny thing, that's, you know, it does resemble Pikachu, and it actually does look cute. They did manage to make that work. And on top of that, like, I can also say the same thing with many of the other Pokemon in here, that they actually do look great. Like, um, another great example, I'm trying to see, like, where I could find this. Uh, right over here, yeah. Like, just, yeah, with, J like, Jigglypuff is another great example. Now, I know it is a little bit of a controversial topic that some people are saying that they don't necessarily like the fur textures on Pokemon, but I mean, the only thing I could say to that is just, like, well, what else can you do? How else can you represent these Pokemon? And, like, even Jigglypuff actually does look great. And there is a bit of a connection with the anime, actually. Um, because, I don't know if you've noticed, like, you got the dude that is actually sleeping, and look at what Jigglypuff is holding. Like, this is actually his famous mic that is also actually a marker. So this is Jigglypuff, not necessarily from the games, but this is, like, Jigglypuff that would come out of the anime. Where, like, he's gonna be pissed off that everybody's sleeping, and then he's just gonna go and draw on everybody. But I will say, though, like, even though I really do like all the des uh, a lot of the designs, and I honestly, I don't mind Mr. Mime. Like, I know a lot of people are saying that, like, Mr. Mime kind of adds nightmare fuel, but I'm not gonna lie. I actually do like how Mr. Mime does look right over here, even though, yeah, it is pretty obvious that he has, like, freaking dodgeball shoulders. But... I'm not going to say that all of them actually look good. There are some of them that they do look a little bit weird. Like, uh, one example is actually with Psyduck. I don't know. I feel like they might have gone a little bit too much in terms of his textures. Psyduck kind of looks weird. And another example for me is actually with uh, Charizard. I, like, I don't know about you guys. Like, the design, you know, like, maybe you like the designs of Charizard, but it's just like... I feel like they might have gone a little bit too much in terms of its texture. And, I don't know, it just... It looks a bit weird. It looks a bit uncomfortable. They might have done a little bit too much of a job on Charizard right there. Where it, it kind of seems a bit unappealing. Where they kind of went a little bit too far in terms of trying to make Charizard look realistic in the real world. But, uh, that's only in terms of the visual aspect... But uh, another thing that I want to mention right over here is actually in this trailer, it's actually very clever what it actually did. It's uh, like one thing I've noticed is how it really does try to make it appealing for both modern Pokemon fans and non-Pokemon fans. Because on one hand, you do notice that it's not just the main 151 that this movie wants to highlight. There are a lot of times when you do even see some, whoop, excuse me, uh, you do see some of the more modern Pokemon that are actually involved. Like there are times when, um, yeah, like, uh, hold on, right over here where you see uh, Pikachu and Justice Smith, that they are running away from a group of Greninjas. And you do see like a little bit of uh, other more recent Pokemon like... Uh, Another example is this establishing shot uh, where you see Pikachu just uh, outside proving to him that only he can comprehend Pikachu. And you see on the top corner where you see a bunch of Emolgas uh, just hanging out on top of a tent. So that's another example how they're not just going after uh, just the main Pokemon that, ev that everyone knows about, but uh, they're also going 
out to implement some of the newer Pokemon as well. But also, at the same time, for the non-Pokemon fans, they really do highlight many of the main Kanto Pokemon. Uh, many of the main 151. Like, they're like the prominent stars. Like, of course, uh, we do have Pikachu. You know, we got Pikachu that's like the star of the whole thing. Uh, but then, like I've already mentioned, uh, you got Jigglypuff. And then, like, you got this one little scene where we see, like, a little herd of Bulbasaurs uh, just walking around. And then, of course, like, right at the end, uh, we got that shot of Mr. Mime and Charizard. And also, many other uh, well-known Kanto Pokemon that are featured. Like, you do see a little bit of Charmander. Uh, you see, like, the, the first thing that you notice, probably the first Pokemon you might see is actually Dodrio. And, oh, I, I just noticed that, like... In the uh, bottom right corner, there's another Dodrio on the side. So, yeah, it does high like, even though there are the main Pokemon, like, even though, like, we do see a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the new and old Pokemon, they do highlight the old Pokemon to make it appealing to those that are not necessarily too familiar with the modern Pokemon that we have right now. And honestly, it is that, yeah, and someone even mentioned in the chat wall that, um, Squirtle is also in there as well. You do see a little shot of Squirtle. If I can actually, f I wonder if I can actually find that. Yeah, right over here where, um, like you see, uh, Justice Smith and Pikachu, they're behind this cage with a bunch of people. And like, you got a, you got a bird Pokemon right over here. I, I forgot his name, but I know he's in the fifth generation. And then like on the right corner, you do see Squirtle. So yeah, it really does highlight a lot of the main Pokemon. And, um... Uh, you know, it's actually really cool to see and I decided to do a little bit of a, uh, of an experiment with this one and I decided to go and show it to my parents because they were parents who grew up with a kid, most namely me, uh, that loved Pokemon back during its heyday in the late 90s and early 2000s and stuff like that and I showed it to them and even they were really impressed and even willing to want to actually go and see it. Even my mom was there, like, she actually recognized many of the Pokemon. It's like, I know this guy, I know this guy, I know this guy, like, more so than just Pikachu. You know, and it's actually really interesting because I feel like among all the trailers that we have seen this week, this is probably the most effective and probably... Turn, you know, like it might turn out to be one of the most hyped up movies of 2019. Like even me, I'm really excited to go and check this one out. So yeah, I will say that this trailer does look pretty interesting and it did make a great first impression. Now, in terms of the story and stuff like that, I guess we'll just have to wait and see and maybe they'll just stick more to the script with what they did with the Detective Pikachu 3DS game since technically, yes, this does count as a movie based on a video game. Maybe not necessarily the main Pokemon RPG games, but still, it is based on the 3DS game Detective Pikachu. So, the funny thing is, um, yeah, this does look actually pretty interesting and uh as for me as someone who loves pokemon uh i am actually really excited to see this detective pikachu movie so this is going to be coming out on may 10th 2019 so uh i am absolutely going to keep my eye out on that so the fact that i don't hate this is definitely a good sign that this could actually be really promising so who knows? And I will add in as well, uh, before anyone else would mention, yes. Um, yeah, Detective Pikachu, of course, this is the first time we hear him, at, uh, like, with Ryan Reynolds' voice. And, yeah, it's gonna be funny to hear, like, Deadpool as Pikachu. But it, from what we hear in this one, he does do a pretty good job, I will say. Like, not just, like, as, like, the snarky detective, but also, like, we see a bit of emotion onto him as well. So... Um, yeah, I'm definitely excited for this one. So, with all that said, I would like to go into the chat wall right now, and I would like to ask, what do you guys think of this trailer of Detective Pikachu? Are you guys excited for this movie to come out? Are you guys a little bit doubtful? Do you love the visual effects? Do you guys not? I would like to know, what are your thoughts right over here? Uh, let's see. As much as I dislike the Pokemon games or anime, I'm willing to give Detective Pikachu a chance. This hybrid design uh, and animation looks top-notch, and the fact that they are adapting from an obscure Pokemon game 
could provide great material, uh, a strong narrative, and social commentary. Maybe this could end up being the best video game based movie of all time. That is true. I mean, I don't think there has ever been a movie that is based on a video game that got this much hype. So that could actually be something. And even for you who didn't really like po who don't really like Pokemon in general, if you're open for this, then I think this trailer here is definitely doing something right. Uh, let's see now. As much as I love the trailer, I do have a problem with it. Ryan Re Reynolds' voice. I don't know, I was kind of expecting him to play a bit more uh, with his voice uh, and make Pikachu sound a bit more unique, but he sounds way too much like a PG Deadpool in my opinion. However, I still have faith in him and I know that he'll bring charm to the character. It's his voice that has a problem, not his performance. I do kind of get what you're saying here. I mean, like, they're not going to go immediately with uh, the Pikachu voice going, Pika Pika, you know, and stuff like that. I think it's more, I, I think they have done this on purpose to make it more like a contradicting voice, to make it sound a little bit more like the opposite, a bit more of an unexpected voice to come out of a Pikachu. I mean, that's kind of like the reason why everybody was so uh, hyped up into thinking about this idea about having Danny DeVito voice Pikachu. I mean, that's why it became such a major thing, because, like, it's such an opposite uh, reaction where it feels like it, it seems like a perfect fit. But Ryan Reynolds does sound like he is doing a good job. I, I don't know about you. I do like it. Uh, let's see now. Uh, Detective Pikachu looks amazing. I'm already hyped for it, even though it doesn't come out in my country until June. Uh, but between that movie and the fact that Infinity War 2 is being released just a week before, I'm kind of worried on the box office performance of Ugly Dolls. Both Ugly Dolls and Missing Link are being released in my country on the same day, actually. Yeah, Ugly- yeah, I don't know about you, I think Ugly Dolls is just gonna flop. I mean, like, everybody is already calling it out as a Trolls ripoff, so... Yeah, that thing is gonna tank. Don't worry about Ugly Dolls, because it shall fail. Or at least it will most likely fail, unless it, like, it could surprise me and, like, it'll make hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. Who the fridge knows, but... But the way I see it, yeah, it looks like it's gonna fail. But, uh, with Detective Pikachu, I think it's gonna do well on its own. Maybe not in the levels of Infinity War 2, but... Like, if, if it keeps come if it keeps going like this, and that, you know, if it will come out, you know, still getting this hype, and people are still enjoying it, and it might, and if it could actually get some positive reviews, then it could have a chance that it will be successful in itself. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see on that. Okay, um, I think with all that said, we're pretty much good with all the trailers. Now... We've pretty much got our hours fill of all the trailers that we have received this week from all the Toy Story 4 stuff, to Wonder Park, to Dumbo, to, po to Pokemon Detective Pikachu. And now it shall be time to go into a store, to actually a new story. And there is actually one that is worth talking about right over here. And there have been a few animation news that have been popping out. But there is one in particular that really did catch my eye, and the animation historian side of me, and also the epic Mickey side of me, is actually really excited for this one. And that is the fact that we have found another Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon. Yes, apparently one of the lost Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons called Neck and Neck has actually just been recently discovered. And apparently, this was actually in Japan, in the hands of anime historian Yasumi Watanabe, who is currently 84. And he actually discovered that he had this old 16mm reel that he bought way back when he was a teen in high school. And it had the title of Mickey Manga Speedy, or in English, Mickey Cartoon Speedy. But it actually turns out to be two minutes worth of a lost Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon called Neck and Neck. And it states here in my source, the, uh, uh, the Asashi, uh, uh, sorry, I need to, it, it's not easy to say the title, uh, from the Asashi Shimbun, it states that in the two minute version, a dog policeman on a motorbike chases Oswald and his girlfriend who are on a date in a car. 
When the speeding car and motorbike hit contorted valleys and steep mountain roads, the characters and the vehicles stretch and shrink, a convention commonly used in Disney's work over the years. And uh, if I can say something to the Asashi Shimbun, um, just to let you know guys, that's called squash and stretch. That is known to be one of the main principles in animation. It's not just Disney who's doing it, it's practically all animation in general, so yeah. Well, don't be surprised about the uniqueness that, oh, it has squash and stretch, wow. <laughs> I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, uh, a lot of people have done that. I don't know if you've watched a lot of cartoons lately, but uh, it's pretty common. But anyways, uh, going back into uh, the story right over here, uh, Watanabe did actually try to go and contact uh, some of the historians that do specialize on Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. They did contact, uh, he actually went and contacted the Walt Disney Archives, and he actually did contact the author of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, The Search for the Lost Disney Cartoons, and uh, they both actually did confirm that this is indeed one of the seven lost Oswald cartoons, which is neck and neck. Now, even though this isn't the full version, this isn't the full five minutes worth, considering that this is the two minute retail version that they don't mind selling it to the public, um, th you know, it is still something that they did actually discover. And uh, we actually do have some quotes from these people, like uh, Watanabe did state that, uh, as I've been a Disney fan for many years, I've, I am happy that I was able to play a role in this discovery. And on top of that, we also got a quote from Becky Klein, director of the Walt Disney Archi uh, Archives, stating that we're absolutely delighted to learn that a copy of the lost film exists. And finally, one major quote from, uh, from David Bozert himself, it actually states that it is a very exciting find. I would like to screen this in Los Angeles for a group of animation scholars. So that's basically the big thing that is currently going on. And uh, they even did mention, uh, just to read another source here, that uh, there is a way that the public can see this uh, just a little bit. Uh, but it says that thanks to Bozard's book, a 35mm film showing 50 seconds of Neck and Neck was also found at the Toy Film Museum in Kyoto. So that's pretty much the big thing is that we have found another Oswald cartoon, which in this case is Neck and Neck. Which now in total, I believe the count of all the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons that have been found or that we can go and check out... It's now piled up to 20 because in total, and uh, yeah, I am kind of using my source in uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, a little shameless, but still, like, just need to grab something quick for a full list of all the Oswald cartoons. Uh, they, they, you know, there have been a lot that have been rediscovered. And even though there are still some that are lost, but, you know, the most exciting thing about this is the fact that we are seeing more Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons that are being rediscovered more so than being lost. Because currently, the list of lost cartoons that we have so far includes The Banker's Daughter, Rickety Gin, um, we got Harem Scarum, we got Sagebrush Sadie, we got Ride'em Plowboy, and finally we got Hot Dog. But in terms of the ones that have been recently discovered... Uh, these would include poor, like, we got Poor Papa, which was the first ever Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon created. Uh, we also got, um, we got Empty Socks that has been discovered. We also got The Old Swimming Hole. And then, uh, we got Africa Before Dark. We got, I believe, is, uh... Uh, I believe uh, Ozzy in the Mounted, or I don't think so. Maybe not that one. We got Hungry Hobos, that counts as one. Uh, we also got Sleigh Bells, and we got High Up. And now, Neck and Neck is the eighth Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon that has been rediscovered. So, eight rediscovered cartoons compared to six that are currently lost. And for me, that actually is pretty exciting, and it makes me, it honestly makes me, it makes me feel, sorry about the stuttering, uh, but it makes me feel pretty optimistic over the fact that we're, that maybe one day, all the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons might end up being discovered. Because it feels like year after year, 
Oswald is getting a bit of his 15 minutes of fame with a rediscovered cartoon. And even Disney is actually pretty excited to the point that nowadays it's almost like a tradition that with every release of their Walt Disney signature collection on Blu-ray and, uh, and DVD of many of their classics like Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi, Peter Pan, and all that kind of stuff, they would go and include an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon. And there are some like Africa Before Dark. You can find it on the Bambi DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, you got Poor Papa, which they also released that on Pinocchio. And um, I believe they put one also in Snow White. Yeah, Hungry Hobos, they actually put it up available on the Snow White Blu-ray. So, you know, it actually is pretty exciting that if this does continue, if we do continue this momentum, then eventually all the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons are going to be discovered. And this is actually pretty exciting considering that there was a, a once upon a time that only half of the Walt Disney Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons were discoverable, that they only had just half of that and then all the others were pretty much missing, or even less than half actually. But now, we do have like more and more that are being resurfaced. And what's actually really exciting about this is that this piece of news that an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon has been discovered, um, what's honestly really interesting with this one is the fact that this actually made it as major news, not just in terms of entertainment news where we would see it in articles from like Variety, Deadline, The Rap, and all that kind of stuff, but we are also seeing it from some of the mainstream news, like mainstream media is also covering it. Like I saw that CNN, that MSNBC, uh, BBC, and all those news sources, they're all covering the fact that an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon is, it just got discovered. And it really is exciting that Oswald really is getting that much attention to even to the point of getting the attention of mainstream media, which not even like some of the more modern cartoons of our days can even try to get, you know, it really is exciting that like, uh, uh, you know, like an old cartoon like Oswald the Lucky Rabbit is getting back in the headline and really, Ever since Bob Iger bought Oswald back to Disney and ever since Epic Mickey, like the popularity of Oswald really did go up where like now we know who Oswald the Lucky Rabbit is. We know his history. We know his connection with Walt Disney, you know? And like, I got this statue right over here of Walt Disney and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit that's also prominent in my videos and uh, just trying to make sure I can position this well, but... Yeah, you know, it really is exciting that we are seeing this happen a as well. It, you know, it honestly is great. And maybe one day we will eventually see if maybe a full version of Neck and Neck. But honestly, with this news right over here, it really does make me pretty optimistic that maybe one day we will see a lot more Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons come out. So yeah, this honestly actually is really exciting. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much, uh, Yasushi Watanabe, for this uh, impeccable discovery. So hopefully one day we will see Neck and Neck be public and uh, hopefully one day we will see more Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons actually be discovered. So, with all that said and done, I would like to know what do you guys think about this uh, discovery? What do you think about the discovery of Neck and Neck? Are you optimistic about more Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoons being discovered? Do you guys want to see this? Uh, do you think this is like massively newsworthy? I would like to know what you think. Alright, let's see now. Uh, it's always great to see a lost cartoon, but I think Disney needs to use Oswald more often instead of being a cameo tool, uh, the exception being Epic Mickey since he is important to the games. Well, I mean, that is up to Disney, and I mean, it is true that for the most part, they are using Oswald more as a merchandise type of character, and like, the only thing that they really are using him is just in terms of a, uh, you know, just use as a cam a cameo device on, like, uh, the, the modern Mickey Mouse cartoons and stuff like that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Like, I've heard rumors that there is a possibility we will see an Oswald the Lucky Rabbit TV series that does star Oswald, but I guess we will just have to wait and see on that. 
Uh, let's see. Why? Uh, I would like to ask, why Mickey Manga Speedy? Well, it is in Japan, so... I mean, I guess that is the only way they would want to try to sell these reels and sell these cartoons. So, using the image of Mickey Mouse, and I mean, like, Oswald does look a little bit like Mickey Mouse, so in a way, I guess it, it could fool people. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if technically what Watanabe has is not an official Disney licensed product. In fact, uh, it does have an image of what, like, the intro looks like. You, As you can see, like... Um, it, it actually has the title card of, uh, Mickey Manga Speedy, and you see Mickey, like, he looks a little bit off. This is not something that was officially drawn by Disney, so it would not necessarily surprise me if the fact that what he owns that has that Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon was not something that was officially licensed by Disney. So that could actually be the case. Uh, let's see... Uh, oh, I will. I, I I love how Japan found a Oswald the uh, a lost Oswald cartoon. Yes, I would I would love to see more Oswald cartoons. All right, that's nice. Uh, dang, the fact that Japan has its hands on it since the twenties, I can imagine how hard it must be uh, to have this cartoon in Japanese hands, especially before World War II. You know that is actually a a, a pretty good point, actually. And considering that with Neck and Neck, that it is a cartoon release in uh, 1928. And you got to keep in mind that Watanabe bought this back when he was a teenager. So we're probably talking about 70 years ago. So if I can do my calculations correctly, uh, let me just see. Uh, let's see, 1928 and 70. And if you put that, so let's see, 19... No, actually, you know what? Technically, 70 year like 70 years ago, it would actually be hold on. Wait a minute. Yeah, 70 yeah, yeah, yeah. 70 years ago from now, that would actually be 1918, 1928, 38. No, it would actually I think he actually bought this just after World War II. I think it yeah, like legit, it was just after not um just after World War II, because if he did bought it as a teenager then if it were it was like 70 years ago it would have he would have purchased this back in 1948 so that could actually be the case yeah not, yeah 70 years ago is 1948 so it, it definitely is after world war ii so that could be the time when western like you know western pop culture could start being integrated onto japan now maybe i'm wrong in that case i haven't fully checked out uh like japanese history if that would actually be true but that is my guess right over there and uh yeah i think we are pretty much all good with uh this story right over here but now we actually have the grand finale. I actually do have one more story that I would like to uh, talk with you guys. And uh, this is honestly something that I have held to myself for many months from now. It's something that I've kept for so long. I didn't know when it would be the right time to go and discuss it. But a part of me felt both nervous and excited to finally just let it out. To just let it go, basically. So, it is something that I am a little bit nervous to go and discuss to you guys. But I feel like right now, it is something that it must be said. It must be something that I need to go and talk about. And no, this is not regarding any of the animation news. This is not about Stan Lee. This is not about Garfield. Or anything like that. Uh, this is something more connected to myself, actually. So, I would like to ask in the chat wall, uh, guys, would you like? How would you like to know about why I quit? Hold on a sec. Uh, it's still loading. Ah, fudge and habit. <laughs> okay, come on. So, how would you guys like to know? why I quit Mr. Code and Friends. I am ready to go and fully discuss with you guys about why and fully explain everything about my side of the uh, situation. So I just want to know, Chatwall, are you ready to go and uh, hear me about my side of this? All right, so it seems like uh, a lot of people want to hear it out. Okay, good. 
So I think with that said, I guess we can now go and uh, discuss about this whole situation. Explain about why is it that I've left the website. So here, okay. With all that said and done, here we go. I mean, I, I've, hold, I've held this for like many months and I was wondering about when this moment would come. But now, screw it, let's go ahead and do this. So for those of you that don't necessarily know, uh, Mr. Conan Friends, I guess in layman's terms, it's basically a Channel Awesome clone. It, it's basically a website that is... That, that would function very similarly to that guy with the glasses where it's basically this website that would host a series of reviewers as you could see right over here. And I joined the website way back in my very beginnings, like way back when I started making videos uh, in early 2010. I think at that time I was still making uh, animation look back Disney animation. I think I was still making those parts because I remember it took me many months just to edit them alone. So uh, I think it was during that time when uh, I ended up joining this website. And throughout that time, throughout my eight years when I was there, uh, probably the best thing that has happened was that I have made a lot of great friends. Like if they're, if my friends are not in the Quebec area, then they are most likely people that I have met through the Mr. Coat website. And there have been a lot of them that I still cherish my friendship with them to this day. From uh, Morgan Ledger, to Jaime Tude, uh, Ryan Hip, Joey Tedesco, Mike Dutton, Sonic Guru, and uh, uh, South Jersey Sam, and a whole bunch of other people. And on top of that, it does include a whole bunch of great content creators as well, from uh, David Rose, to Some Jerk With A Camera, Pan pizza and all those guys so it was essentially a little hub and a little group of creators like you know it's not necessarily a popular website it wasn't even a popular website at its time like there were other websites that were a little more prominent and a little more popular in terms of the channel awesome clones like uh, rvt or agony booth or manic expression or those guys but it's just like with, with this one they are their own unique people. And that, that's kind of the thing. But then, you have Mr. Coat himself. Or as I would refer to him, well, by his real name, Stefan. Or Stefan, or whatever. But I, I would call him Stefan. And the thing is, with Stefan, he's a little more different than everyone else. And he can be a very nice guy. He can be very friendly. He can be very helpful. But there isn't anybody that I am aware of that is legitimately a friend to Stefan. Like, you know, the, the, the fact that the website is called Mr. Coat and Friends. Uh, maybe there are some within, like, the contributors. But I don't know any who is a legitimate buddy to Stefan. Like, uh, someone who would hang out with him to go and just have a nice little chat. Like, oh, hey, how's work doing? Hey, uh, how's your new review going? And all that kind of stuff. Or like, hey, have you played this new video game? Or stuff like that, you know. You know, like, that. Like I don't know if there's anybody who would legitimately have that kind of friendship with Stefan that I know about in terms of the contributor's with uh, Mr. Coat. But the thing is with Stefan is that he has this one problem and this one issue that really does get a lot of people's nerves. Because the thing with Mr. Coat is that he values his opinion on movies more so than people. And that is going to be a recurring theme that I'm going to bring up quite often. Because the thing is with Stefan, yes, he is pretty well known in terms of his opinions where he likes being in the minority, where he wants to root for the 
underdog per se, and he wants to show a lot of support for the underappreciated. This is why he is someone that doesn't necessarily root for companies like Disney or Universal and stuff like that, but he would state that his favorite animation studios are some of the lower tier ones, like Blue Sky Studios or Sony Pictures Animation, that he would go and root for those. However, he would also be the type of person that with his opinions, he would really try to push hard on that. And honestly, the thing is, like with his opinions, uh, like I do not mind at all the fact that, you know, he enjoys underappreciated movies. That is not an issue at all. Like, you know, good on him for liking some movies that are not generally liked by audiences and stuff like that. You know, that, you know, that's his opinion and that is perfectly fine. But the real big issue with Stefan is the fact that with these opinions, he somehow thinks that there is a bit of, of a superiority. Where he would have this air when he would express his opinions where he would say that I like this project that you don't. Therefore, that makes me better than you. He thinks that because... He likes these underappreciated things like rather it be movies like The Nut Job or studios like Sony Pictures Animation. He somehow believes that he is in the superiority compared to someone who doesn't like it. Like he really does. Like I said, he values his opinions on movies more so than others. And that could be quite a problem because sometimes he would really try to cram in his opinions even at times when it really does feel unwelcome. Like, I would go and make a post on Twitter and talk about this movie that kind of su that kind of sucks. You know, I would talk about, like, Nutjob and how the movie is stupid, and then suddenly he would just barge in and act really snarky and really condescending, where he would say, like, Oh, you mean that really entertaining movie that has a lot of great qualities into it? Why, yes, I'm actually one of those people that really do enjoy those because I believe that it is great. And, like, it can even work on the opposite end as well, where, like, you're not even talking about the movie he would be talking about. And I remember, like, I would say, like, oh, yeah, Coco is definitely going to win the Oscar. I mean, it's hands down the best animated movie of the year. And then he's just going to barge in saying, well, I think that Ferdinand is actually much better than Coco. And I am really glad that it actually got nominated for an Oscar because it really is well-deserving for such an amazing movie. <coughs> so that's kind of the big thing there, where really... He acts really snobbish, and he acts really snobby, and honestly, down to the point where, with his opinions, he's being really disrespectful towards others. Where really, he cares more about the movies than the well-being of others, just by, like, really shoving his opinion down to the point where... Yeah, it really feels unwelcome where, you, you know, like when you're in a party or something like that and someone says something random and someone would say, yeah, no one asked for your opinion. Stefan is that guy. Stefan is that person that no one really asked their opinion for. And on top of that, there are times when it can even go a little bit too far as well. I remember there was this one post on Facebook that South Jersey Sam has stated. Um, it was actually an incident regarding Peter Rabbit, where in his fan club, uh, there were a lot of people that were laying a lot of crap on trailers of Peter Rabbit. Like, the film has not been released yet, and the only thing that we could judge it by is through its trailers. Now, regardless of what you think about Peter Rabbit, you can enjoy the movie, um, you might not enjoy it, but I think we can all agree... Those trailers are freaking garbage. They are such a massively poor representation of what the, the movie would actually be. And it just seems like it would pass off as one of those like live action animation hybrids that tries desperately to be cool and hip. You know, stuff like Alvin and the Chipmunks and uh, the Smurfs and all that kind of stuff. And apparently at that moment, Stefan actually snapped. Like, he actually yelled and attacked people for just simply bashing the trailer of Peter Rabbit. Like, 
he legit just came out like, What you guys shut the hell up? What the hell is wrong with you idiots? And stuff like that. Like, maybe he didn't say that exactly, but um, that's from what I've read about the post uh, made by South Jersey Sam. Like, he'll probably explain it better in detail, but that's kind of the idea, again, to show how Stefan, clearly in this case, he cares a lot more about Peter Rabbit more so than others, where really he could just push anyone aside in favor of this one movie that really it doesn't matter, where he doesn't understand the fine line of when it's just a kid's movie, you know, like it doesn't really matter because all it is is just a movie and it's not really worth it to go after people for that. You know what I mean? Like with Peter Rabbit, you know, is it really worth it to go and attack people just for expressing their opinions on a trailer for it? I mean, it's God Forsaken Peter Rabbit. All it is is just an Alvin and the Chipmunk style kids movie. And that's it. It's nothing more. So then there was one day. Um, I remember Stefan, he messaged me on Facebook stating that, Oh, I wish that you you would, hi you know, I, I, it's hard to really say. I'm trying to remember. But, you know, he said some something in the veins that he wishes that I value his opinions more and that I would talk to him more. Which honestly kind of made me snap a little bit. And honestly, I feel like, okay, at that point, the gloves are off, and I feel like I might as well give him a hard truth, which I have done that to some people. I am that kind of friend who is not necessarily afraid to lay down my thoughts about someone's issues and what they need to go and fix up. So I confronted him about this, and he also mentioned to me about how, oh, he wants to create this highly positive environment. He wants to spread positivity and optimism and try to avoid as much negativity and criticism as much as possible. So from there, I decided to lay out and be fully honest with him. But even though, yeah, I was kind of hard on him when I was messaging him that, I also was trying to be encouraging to say that, you know, like, even though you have these problems, I do have confidence that maybe you can grow as a person, that, you know, it's going to help you out, be a better critic and be a better individual so that, you know, your opinions can be well respected. Because here's the thing, honestly, I don't value his opinions at all because clearly he doesn't value mine. And like, he seems to care more about his own opinions than me as an individual. So why should I care about his opinions? On, on movies and what he thinks. So I laid down my opinion on him. So I laid it all out and Stefan messaged me back saying that, oh, thank you for the criticisms. I will take note of that in order to go and improve. So he laid down that little message right there. And then I noticed something uh, a little bit off by that, where even though he says that he appreciates the criticism, he would then go on, create an entire list of pinpointing literally everything that I've stated and try to make up an excuse for it. And that's when I realize something is a little bit off. Where even though he has noticed uh, that I am giving criticism to him, he, it doesn't seem like he appreciates the criticism, but rather just trying to find an excuse for literally every single thing that I've pointed out to him from being, from making those condescending comments on social media, uh, from the whole Peter Rabbit incident and all that kind of stuff. So it did got me a little bit curious and wondering like, is he really that appreciative? But then suddenly, just a few days later, I kid you not, Stefan came in and he said to me, I gave it a bit of thought and I think we should end our mutual relationship. Like, are you freaking kidding me, dude? Like, is that a freaking joke? Because, Stefan, you flat out lied to me, man. You seriously lied to me. Like, you said that, oh, you appreciate the criticisms, you'll take note of that, you'll learn to improve, and then you say, like, I don't think we should be friends anymore. Yeah, that is total bullcrap, man. You saw my opinions that I gave to you, the criticisms that I gave to you, and you just threw it in the trash, and you decide to distance from me. And that's when I decided, okay, you know what? 
I mean, you're a freaking dick, and I've considered this for a very long time, ever since Morgan quit, uh, Mr. Coat. I decided, you know what, I, you know, I quit the website. Take all my videos off of my site. Take all, take all the videos off of your website, and we're gonna split ways from there. And which, he agreed. Like, he is more than happy to do so, because apparently he considered that as well. And then soon afterwards, I immediately decided, you know what, yeah, if I'm out of Mr. Code, then I'm pretty much out of Stefan for good. So on top of that, I also decided to go and block him on Twitter and block him on Facebook on everything. Because honestly, with the way Stefan acts, again, with how he values his own opinions on movies more so than the well-being of others, at that point, I realized he is a toxic individual. And with toxic individuals, I can recognize them, and I gotta get away from them as much as possible. So right afterwards, um, nothing has changed really since. Uh, considering that with, uh, with Stefan, and trust me, yeah, there is a little bit more to this story, by the way. I went on and I contact, uh, actually, it was, uh, James, Jaime Tude, he was the one who contacted me, and he got a little bit curious, where he was wondering, you quit Mr. Code, and I told, you know, and I explained to him the whole situation of what's going on, and he decided to get down a little bit into it as well, and wondered about the whole situation as well, so, he asked about, he asked to Stefan about what's going on, and then, what, Stefan did, uh, did message him, and the story has pretty much been confirmed. And apparently, uh, this is a screenshot that uh, James actually shared with me. And this is apparently what Stefan told James about me, about why I had to leave Mr. Co. So he states, To make a long story short, it was clear our ideologies were extremely far apart. He felt I was too positive. I thought he was too cynical. Okay, stop. Stefan, are you freaking kidding me? I'm too cynical. Have you seen the people on your freaking website? I'm the one that's too cynical. Like, are you kidding me? What about, you know, like, have you, like, more than half of these people are, like, absolutely, are equally or even more cynical than me. Like, some jerk off a camera, Pam Pizza, Joey Tedesco, like, even James. Like, are you kidding me? I'm the one that is cynical. Are, are, like, are you for real, dude? And keep in mind, I know a lot of people really do remember about the ones that I, that I would give the Animat Seal of, like, the movies I would give the Animat Seal of Garbage towards, but keep in mind, like, there are a lot of movies as well that I would be more positive towards. So I don't know what the fridge you're talking about that I'm the one being a little too cynical, dude. I mean, you gotta be joking with that. Okay, anyways, let's continue. What the fridge else did this guy say to James? Uh, it states here, uh, I am an ad... Oh, I am an ad ardent... Oh, I am an ardent Sony supporter. He is not. Uh, I've never been comfortable with some of his remarks made towards animators and filmmakers over the years. Okay, hold on a sec. Okay, the factor of being a Sony supporter and stuff like that. I have already stated that... You know, the whole factor with Sony Pictures Animation or with Sony Pictures and stuff like that, that has never been an issue. Like, in fact, many of my friends are even fans of the Sony movies and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and all that kind of stuff. That has never been something that has been a problem with me, nor has this ever been a problem with Stefan. Now, I'm just saying, hopefully this is not the case, but if Stefan thinks that it's really justifiable to kick me out because I don't so support Sony Pictures as much as he does, then that is honestly freaking pathetic. Again, I really do hope that is not the case, you know? Uh, anyways, and I don't know what the fridge he's talking about. I've never been comfortable with some of his remark towards animators and filmmakers over the years. You mean giving criticism to them, Stefan? I'm just doing a job. I, I, I'm honestly just doing my job as a critic because that's what you're supposed to do. Sometimes you do have to be cynical and give criticism to some of the animators and the filmmakers, dude. That's just a part of the job. You should know, dude, more than anyone else. Anyways, um, there was just too much friction behind the scenes you may not have been uh, privy to, and to avoid getting too toxic, it was best that we part ways. 
it is ultimately better for everyone. And as we continue talking about this, it pretty, like, at that point, James is pretty much confident that, like, what, like, yeah, basically, I told him the truth. I was honest to him, which I am. And from there, James also told me about his side, about his relationship with Stefan. And this is honestly very interesting because this is actually something that many contributors actually know about Mr. Coat is that st that James told me that he keeps his relationship with Stefan strictly professional. Nothing more because Stefan is infamous for being incapable of taking any form of criticism. He, like, not only does he hate negativity and criticism and all that kind of crap, he is incapable himself of taking any form of criticism. If you don't give him praise, if you don't tell him that he's doing a good job and you're just giving him notes on what to do on how that he can improve, he would just absolutely hate it. And he would honestly resent you for that. Like, he would just take it and he would just throw it in the trash. Just like what he did with me. Where I gave him critics, criticism and he decided to take all that, throw it in the trash, and distance myself from me. Because apparently, giving criticism to him, that seems to be too toxic for Stefan. So yeah, he does have a pretty infamous reputation of incapable of handling any criticism whatsoever. And honestly, that also plays a big factor into why I do not value any opinion that he has. In fact, he shouldn't be in a position of criticizing anything if he himself is incapable of handling any form of godforsaken criticism. I mean, seriously. Like, he here's the thing, Stefan. Do you really think you should be in a position of power where you would say which thing is good and which thing is bad when you yourself, you can't be able to have people to tell you what are some of your good traits and what are some of your bad traits? You can't judge other things when people can't judge you. That's part of the package of being a freaking film critic. I don't know about you, but I feel like if you're a critic, then you need to learn to take criticism yourself. Sometimes that's not necessarily an easy job, and yeah, it, it is hard for everyone, and including myself, but still, you gotta learn when to accept criticism in order to go and improve yourself, not just as an individual, but also professionally. So seriously, this is why I really don't care about any of Stefan's opinions, because really, at this point, like, if he cannot handle any form of criticism, then why should I take his criticism seriously on anything? Especially, again, when he, when he would value his opinions more so than anyone else. And on top of that, um, you know, that's actually not the only reason as to why I decided to go and, uh, leave the Mr. Coat, uh, community, to leave the Mr. Coat website. Uh, yeah, Stefan did play a big part, but there is also another major factor, and I am not afraid to call out some people on this, and that is actually regarding the community. Now, as you're probably aware, in terms of the Mr. Co community, of course, since Stefan is a huge fan of Sony Pictures Animation, so are his fans. Like, the people who do appeal to Mr. Coat are also major fans of Sony Pictures Animation, and they love it when he would go and give them praise. Kind of fuel a bit of their ego, saying that Sony Pictures Animation is good, Sony Pictures Animation is good, yes, tell me about things that I like to hear, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know that throughout the years, I have been pretty heavy on Sony Pictures Animation. Uh, pretty brutal and harsh if you will, and sometimes there might have been moments maybe I have uh, crossed the line a little bit, uh, down to the point where I have been into some controversy even. Now, it did take me a little bit of a while, but um, it is thanks to Yoshi Player and his friends uh, to really get it through my thick, stupid head about what I need to do in order to improve on my criticisms towards Sony Pictures Animation, to not go too far with it. Where my opinions on Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs and Hotel Transylvania, Emoji Movie, they are perfectly fine, but not go too heavy on the studios and the animators that have worked on them. And I have put that on practice on some of my more recent reviews on Sony, like Hotel Transylvania 3 and Open Season. So I am doing my best 
best to go and improve myself, not just as an individual, but also as a film critic. But apparently that doesn't seem to be enough for the Mr. Co community, as they are still trying to slander and make a bad name out of me for the comments that I've made about Sony Pictures Animation. And clearly, this is a clear sign right here that the only reason, and seriously, the only justifiable reason why they are doing this, why they are still doing this to this day, to make a bad name out of me, is just because some of the people in the Mr. Co community, they cannot handle any other criticism. They cannot handle any other opinions other than their own. Now, I just want to clarify, though, this does not reflect upon everybody in the Mr. Co community. Because there are a lot of people on in there that are actually great people. You know, there are people that are worth listening to, that they are really nice, they're a lot of fun, and they are really open-minded. But the bad people in Mr. Coat's community are really the ones that do make it toxic. And their love for Sony has really gone to the point that it really has gone to hurt others. And more so than just me. And a good example of that there was one person who is a really toxic individual that all he does is try to spread hate on me just for having a different opinion than him. One person is uh, by the name of Sebastian Villages, or as he calls himself on Twitter, uh, SJW James Bond. Now, that guy right there, I did confront him at one point because he has been very vocal about like hating me and trying to portray me as a terrible person just for not liking Sony Pictures Animation when he obviously does. And I remember I have confronted him on Facebook privately and from there like I would go and continuously ask him the question that just, like, because, like, obviously, he has SJW in his, uh, Twitter handle, so obviously, he would be someone that doesn't like people like, uh, Donald Trump or the neo-Nazi Richard Spencer, so I asked him, because of my opinions on Sony Pictures Animation, do you think it's justifiable to, per to treat me just like as if I was Donald Trump or Richard Spencer? And believe it or not, throughout that whole argument, he kept on refusing to answer the question. He didn't say, you, he, he didn't say like, no, it's not justifiable, that's just wrong. He didn't say that because he knows, and I know, that his answer would be yes. That for Sebastian Villages, if you don't like Sony Pictures Animation, that means that gives him the license to treat you as if you are a Nazi. That Sony, that people who don't like Sony Pictures are basically Nazis. That is his freaking mentality right there. Like, I caught him on the godforsaken act, and seriously, it just went downhill spiral from there. It, it like, really, the, it, it, it's just like, luckily, like, I blocked him, or I think he blocked me. Either way, like, the guy is still, like, I think he is still going around spreading hate on me, but still... Like, th that is his legitimate mentality that he views people who don't like Sony Pictures as full-on Nazis. But there is one individual, one person who has made an infamous reputation among my community, in my fan club, and people who watch my videos and stuff like that, one person whose name has been so toxic that he destroys everything in his path. And I'm talking, of course, about the man named... Chris Etrada. You might find him pretty familiar, and holy crap, this guy, you could say he is a bit of the ringleader of the whole, like, hate towards me. Like, he would try his godforsaken best to try to take me down whatever possible in order to silence my opinion in terms of Sony Pictures Animation. Like, if I said anything bad, about Sony, or if I made one little joke, like, he would go bombastic and try to make, like, a whole angry mob in order to try to take me down. And not only does he have this really serious grudge, but now his tactics in order to try to take me down, he would even go to the point that he would even spread lies. That he would spread false information. Like, he would go full-on Alex Jones. To make me look bad no matter what. And a great example is actually, there was one interaction on Patreon that I actually have here. 
And um, I actually saved this and I actually did screenshots just in case if he would actually go around and keep spreading lies, I could actually pull this up to say, yeah, actually, um, he's not saying the truth. Where there was at one point, he actually accused me, and this was actually in August, like uh, about a month after my Hotel Transylvania 3 review, where he accused me that I would go and attack others uh, for their opinions on liking Sony Pictures Animation. And like, I tried to, you know, and I kept asking him, like, what the fridge are you talking about? And he would kept, he would honestly keep going on about this. And I tried to get a little bit more information. And the funny thing is, is that he wouldn't want to say like, oh, who are the pe, you know, who is it that uh, I did wrongdoing towards, you know? Uh, like, he, he refused to say like, oh, I don't want to reveal the information about these people. And I remember there was at one point, I gave him a major ultimatum where, um, honestly, I think it's in this one. Yes, it's, it's right here where I gave him the ultimatum to say, okay, if you tell me who these people are, I will go and personally make an apology to them both publicly and privately to e each of these individual people. And at that point, that's when he admitted he flat out lied about the information that none of this ever happened. And then he would keep on going about like, oh, oh, I am I am condescending towards the fa fans of Hotel Transylvania, which is not true at all. Like, basically, he's just flat out admitting that he's butthurt that I gave a negative review towards Hotel Transylvania 3. And he would even go on stating, it was like, okay, I I'll read this to you, a little bit of what he says. Okay, what I said wasn't true about the detailed chat logs. At the same time, what you said about certain things isn't true either. Yeah, bull crap, man. He thinks that it's okay for him to lie as long that apparently... So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's at the end. So yes, I made things up in the hopes you would finally learn to be honest and respectful. How am I supposed to be on- Yeah, you want to teach me to be honest and respectful by making freaking lies? Are you freaking kidding me? Like, Jesus balls, dude. Like, honestly, this is- Like, it really does show that he really is messed up. Like, honestly, if Chris Atrada really does act like how he does online, and he, it, it, like, if he acts exactly like he does online, and if he does in real life, then Chris Atrada is clearly mentally ill. He has a serious anger problem, down to the point where he would go and, like, just slander and attack people, even for, like, the slightest things. And there's actually another example of how he would attack others as well. Like, it's not just me. There was even one incident where Chris Atrada even went on to attack uh, Joey Tedesco, where it, it says, like, Guys, please remember that no tagging is allowed. Doesn't matter if they tag you. Don't, re don't retaliate by tagging them back by saying to teach them a lesson as you then break the rules. Like, there's apparently this one little rule, and Joey Tedesco seems to be the one that, like, he kind of broke this rule, and he didn't know, like, it was an honest mistake, and he tried to say, like, uh, he even said here, Did you look up every time I tag? Dude, that makes me seriously feel uncomfortable. Like, I get that you want to follow the rules and all, but this, this, that's a little obsessive, and doesn't make me want to come back to this group. Uh, it was right in the thread which you tagged, hey, I'm not looking up your history. Now stop lying and remove the tags to the thread instead of getting defensive. No, that's weird and I don't remember what the comments are. I wasn't hurting anybody in those last comments and I think you're getting counter defensive. And that's the thing with Chris Atrada. He really does have a serious anger issue. Like seriously, the kind that needs therapy. Or at the most, like the fact that he is still going like this to this day if he belongs in a god- like honestly, if this is how he acts in real life, he belongs in a godforsaken asylum because honestly, I am glad that I don't have the opportunity to actually meet people like Sebastian Villages or Chris Atrada because I got the feeling, at worst, they could legitimately kill me. I mean, you see their behavior, you see how they try to portray me just for having a different opinion than them, so I mean, death could not be out of the option right over here. They might actually go and do that. And it's because of that, 
Like, it really does send a bad signal to the Mr. Co community. It really does make things a whole lot worse to the point that the Mr. Co name is entirely toxic. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that I remember Mr. Co tried to tell me that, oh, he wants to spread, like, he wants to create a positive and optimistic environment with the Mr. Co name. Well, obviously, he doesn't know how to do that. He is obviously a failure when he lets these things happen. That even to this day, that he would go, that he would make his community feel more like an alt-right community. Down to the point that people would, it would become an environment where it's less like a Mr. Co fan club and more like an animat hate club. Where it seems to be okay to slander, to create conspiracy theories, to make up lies, to go and attack individuals that have a different opinion than you. It is honestly absolutely shocking the fact that Mr. Coat would allow this absolute toxicity. And the thing is, with people like Chris Atreta and Sebastian Villages, they have a serious mental problem where they cannot let go of a grudge. Even to this day, they are still going around, especially with Chris Atreta, where he would go around trying to slander my name, trying to make me look bad no matter what, just because of my opinion regarding Sony Pictures and like any other thing like if I have an opinion that's different than him then that gives him permission to just go and try to take me down to destroy everything that I have to really try to rally up an angry mob to go and basically just like want to destroy my reputation with his angry grudge. And even though, even though it's been like months that he's been, or even years, that he's still being, he's still doing that. And actually, you know what? I gotta mention this right now. You know what's the most insane thing about Chris? You know the, the craziest thing? Is actually the fact that there was a once upon a time where Chris Atrada used to like that quote-unquote Sony hate. Where he used to be a fan, and he was one of those people that absolutely loved it when he would see reviews, uh, when he would see reviewers go in full-on rage mode. Like, you know the Nostalgia Critic when he would do his old joke of, I buy credit card, I'll kill you, I'll kill you! Chris used to love that, and he would be willing to spend hundreds, even thousands of dollars just to get that kind of reaction out of people, including me. In fact, he actually did go and spend probably more than around a thousand or even more than two thousand dollars on my Patreon just to go and get that type of reaction. He would be the one responsible that in my P.O. Box show, What's in the Box, he would go and send me caught like multiple copies of Ratatouille and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. And on top of that, he would also go and spend so much money for me to go and review some of the worst animated films out there, like Legend of the Titanic. He re also requested me Food Fight. And also... He was the one that requested me to review Surf's Up to Wave Mania. There would be no other reason why Chris Atrada would want me to review it other than to add fuel to the Sony hate. Now, why is it specifically that he want like he decided to go 180 from absolutely loving it to suddenly just full on hating it is a true mystery to me. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he is lying to everyone at the Mr. Co community that honestly to this day he actually still enjoys it when I would be like all over the top angry and all that kind of stuff. Like maybe he still does enjoy my reviews of like Cloudy 2 and the Emoji Movie and Surf's Up 2 and all that kind of stuff. Maybe he still enjoys that to this day and he's just making things up just to have friends or something like that. I don't know the true reason, but it really does show how Chris Atrada is seriously not mentally well. And the craziest thing is that going back to Stefan, honestly, the actions that people like Chris Atrada is presenting in his fan club, Stefan is a full on complicit. Because I am highly aware that many of his that uh, many of his fans have requested to tell him to make Chris Atrada stop, or even to flat out block him to do something about Chris Atrada, all, where all he does is spread hate on me just for having a different opinion. And every time they would do that, Stefan would either ignore them, or he would just tell them, 
that he's too busy. And that's pretty much it. And you know what? Actions speak louder than words. And honestly, the fact that he still lets people like Chris Atrada try to spread hate and go crazy and spread lies on me, honestly, he supports that. He supports the actions of Chris Atrada to go and slander my name, to spread hatred on me, to make myself look bad just because I have a different opinion than him on Sony Pictures Animation. Like, it's perfectly, like, for Mr. Coat, in his mentality, it is perfectly fine for someone to attack, to harass, and to bully someone else, even by spreading conspiracies and lies, as long it is to, as long as it is to go and cater to his own bias. To go, as long as it's in the name, to make Sony Pictures Animation look good, he is perfectly fine with raising an alt-right environment to go and stop another person's opinion which, which honestly is the only reason why that i can compare people like sebastian villages and chris atrada to the alt-right because clearly they are not supporters of the first amendment they want to try to silence anyone that has a different opinion than them and mr code seems to be perfectly fine because once again, he values his own opinions than the well-being of others. He seems to care more about his opinion on Sony Pictures Animation than the well-being of someone else, to the point that he is perfectly okay that as long as it's for the love of Sony Pictures Animation or for something that he likes, it is perfectly fine to go and attack, to bully, and harass others that is the kind of community that mr code is raising and not only is it making the mr co community highly toxic but on top of that it is also making sony animation fans look bad as well i don't know if he realizes that but he's also giving sony animation a bad name with its community where really with people like mr coat and chris atrada where Fans of Sony Animation seems to be a bunch of ill-tempered, angry man-children that just, they would attack anybody that would have a different opinion than them. If you don't give high praise to, so to Sony Pictures Animation, then they will want your head on a silver platter. That, it seems to be the thing that Mr. Code is pretty much expressing to everyone. The thing that he seems to support. The fact that he cares more about his own bias than anyone else, any other person even. And that, honestly, I gotta say, and honestly, I have to state this right now, that the biggest problem about Mr. Coat and the Mr. Coat fan base is that they have a serious Sony bias problem, more than they would ever claim that I had. If it's down to the point that it really is this extreme, that for months or even for many years, that there are still people who would go attack others for having a different opinion, then seriously, they have bias issues. And that's honestly the reason why I had to quit the Mr. Coat website. Not because that Mr. Coat himself is toxic, but also because the community is toxic and that they all hate my guts anyways, so there's no point of me for staying there. And in my point of view, well, what's honestly sad about this is that I left because I didn't, you know, honestly, when I quit Mr. Code and Friends, I didn't see this as honestly a way to quit the website. I saw it as an escape, as an escape of a toxic environment. And when, like, honestly, it's something that I can only gain by leaving there. And if it reaches up to that point then you know that the place is just, it's no good at all. It is purely dead in the water right there. In fact, I just want to say right now, like even the, the, ta like the title itself of Mr. Code and Friends, like that is, honestly, I would say it's a flat out lie even. Like, I don't know if, if like, if, if these people that you see here would even count as, as Mr. Code's friends. At the most, it, it, would, it, would, it would just be like, Mr. Coat and his acquaintances. That seems like a more accurate title. And you know the craziest thing is, is that Mr. Coat doesn't care. Like he, like you can tell that he only caters to his bias because uh, let me show you something. All right, let's go to uh, that fellow in the coat.com. So, hey, let's go ahead and uh, check out Mr. Coat and friends. You know, let's go and check out this website. Oh, oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. 
I don't know about you, but there was a, I thought at one point, maybe it was just me, but there was at one point, I thought I was banned. Oh, like, ser no joke. Um, maybe, uh, I just want to double check. Yeah, like, th this is a more private bow. Uh, would it be, oh, hold on a sec. Here, let me just redo, here, let me just redo this. I thought, I, I don't know, maybe it was just me, but, uh, here, let me just, uh, uh, Mr. Code and Friends, uh, would I be able to have access? Uh, okay, no, okay. At, at first, I thought I was banned from the website, but no, okay, maybe that's not the case. But may maybe it was just a, a different thing or maybe a server problem. But yeah, um, this is just, but yeah, a anyways, um, maybe that was just me or maybe it was just that day. But anyways, as I was saying um, with the whole thing, yeah, I had to go and escape a toxic environment that that was the whole reason why I had to leave but I know that some of you right now you might be probably wondering and uh, you might have a bit of a question that um, why did I choose to say it now why did I not say it before like when I quit mr. coat well that is uh, honestly a very good question and um uh, honestly, the reason why I didn't say it then when I immediately quit Mr. Code and Friends is honestly because, well, I can't say Mr. Code and Friends, I'll just say Mr. Code, but the reason why I quit Mr. Code, um, and why I didn't say anything about it, it was because, um, it was back in July, it was honestly because it was back in July. And at the time, I already had so many things going on. I just got out of one big drama and I made myself good and happy again. Um, I was about to release my Hotel Transylvania 3 review, which of course uh, is going to have a lot of people talking. And then um, I was also going to get ready to go on vacation. And I already had a whole bunch of videos that I was working on. So I already had enough on my plate as it is. And I feel like adding this as well it would just make things a whole lot more complicated. And I'm just gonna say right now that if there is one thing that the Mr. Code fan club knows what to do more than anything else is really to make a mountain out of a molehill. Like you saw how Chris Atrada went and attacked Joey Tedesco just for that one tiny little thing? Well, yeah, that, that can be pretty common in the Mr. Co. fan club that they would just go after them for so many different reasons, you know? It's just absolutely ridiculous. So honestly, I know that like me revealing this to you right now, it would cause mass hysteria in the Mr. Co. community. But the reason why I decided to go and speak out to this right now is because clearly there is still nothing that is going on right now in order to solve this issue. Because I saw, apparently, there was this one post in my fan club, in the Animat fan club on Facebook, that apparently that this hate driven by Chris Atrada of me is still going on. Not just that, but he is also going after Eye of Soul. And if you guys remember in the last episode, she was a special guest. And yeah, she did a major rant on Illumination Entertainment, but she also went after Sony Pictures Animation as well. And that could be the one thing that would trigger him to go and attack Saul as well. Or maybe it's just the factor that she agreed to collaborate with me can be uh, the factor to that as well. But um, yeah, honestly, that was the moment when I decided, okay, you know what? Enough is enough. Time for me to go and reveal right now and to call out on both Stefan and Chris Atrada and the bad people at Mr. Coat who can't handle hearing an opinion other than anyone else. Because clearly, Chris Atrada is not going to stop because he has an unhealthy grudge that he refuses to let go. It's obvious that Mr. Coat isn't going to do anything because he supports Chris Atrada's actions and he is more than happy to slander anybody who would make a bad name out of Sony Pictures Animation, so I might as well be the only mentally functioning human being to actually do something about it and say enough is enough. To say stop on all this. Seriously. And hopefully, now that I revealed everything to you, now that I shed light onto all this, the one thing that I am hoping for is that some change can actually happen. That hopefully I'm not just pissing in the wind and that something might, might as well be done. Some action can actually happen. Because honestly at this point, from Stefan, I am expecting two different kinds 
of scenarios. Uh, there is an optimistic side and a realistic side. Now, the up uh, the optimistic side of me feels like Stefan is going to be listening to this and he will understand what I am talking about. Like, finally, the criticisms that I have for him and the things that I have been telling him can finally get into his godforsaken head and he'll actually do something about it. That he'll learn to improve himself both as an individual and as a film critic by stop making these condescending and pretentious comments all the time when someone has a different opinion than him and that he would actually raise a more positive environment in the Mr. Co community and that he would actually do something about these alt-right people like Chris Atrada and Sebastian Villages and actually block them from any of his uh, like anything that he has on the internet block him on patreon block him on the fan club block him on his twitter account on youtube on patreon uh, like on everything block access any anywhere and everywhere for them giving him a bad name that he can actually do something about it and actually take action but then there is also the realistic side of me the one that feels like He's going to do exactly like what he just did to me. And all he's going to do is just make a post on Facebook or make a video on YouTube where he's going to lie to his audience, just like how he lied to me, where he says that, oh, I'm going to try to improve. I'm going to, I learned my lesson. I understand. And then right afterwards, he will pinpoint to literally every single thing that I've said and try to make some kind of pathetic excuse. And then right afterwards, he's going to do jack all about it. He's going to do nothing about it, and he's going to return to thinking that he is superior than me, and that he is superior than anyone who doesn't take his side. Because honestly, with Mr. Coat, like with how he is portraying himself right now, the only two people that he cares about is just himself and people who agree with him. Not even his godforsaken fans. I mean, his fans would tell them to do something about the whole Chris Atrada scenario, and he flats out ignores them. So that's honestly the scenarios, and I really am hoping the optimistic side can actually go and happen. And I just want to say right now, Mr. Coat, Stefan, if you are listening to this right now, what I want from you is nothing but to take action. I want to hear nothing coming out of your mouth. I don't want to hear any words that is coming from you. I don't care about any arguments that you would have. I don't care about any explanations that you would have. I don't care if you even give me an apology. I want you to actually do something about it. If you want to prove me wrong, if you want to prove to me that you're not the individual that I am saying that you are, then I want you to take action because actions speak louder than words and though and your actions is the reason why I am saying who you are so if you want to prove to me that you can handle criticism and that you can actually take note and improve from them show me that you actually can show me that you actually do care about your fans and get rid of the alt-right people like Chris Atrada and all those folks and tell them to finally shut up about hating on me and everything like that. You say you care about raising a positive and optimistic environment, but do so more than just catering to your own pathetic bias. And also, if you want to prove to me that you are someone that does value people more so than your opinions, then show me that you can. Show me that your opinions on Sony Pictures are no different than my opinions on Sony Pictures. Because at the end of the day they are nothing more but opinions and that's it it doesn't matter if you support it or if you're against it they're nothing more than just opinions and just that and if you're a real man then you would know that that is actually the truth and if you want you want to prove all that if you want to prove that i'm wrong if you want to prove that you're not raising a toxic environment if you want to prove that you're not a toxic individual I want you to show me. Don't tell me. Don't say anything. Just show it, man. At the end of the day, Stefan, all I ask from you is just shut up and do something. And that is the reason why I quit Mr. Coat. And that is my, uh, my, my whole say on this. Whew. 
I've held this on for so long and man, it's like, I did, honestly, I feel like I did it. I actually finally did it. I called out people like Chris Atrada and Mr. Code on all that kind of crap. I don't want to hear any more idiot trying to say that, oh, I'm a bad person because I don't like Sony animation. Screw you, man. Seriously. Ugh. Wow. And that's pretty much it, folks. I'm pretty much done with this. So with all that said and done, that is pretty much going to be it with this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to put this out of the way. That art, by the way, was actually done by me. That was actually a request a while ago. So yeah, um, that's pretty much my entire reason about uh, Mr. Code. And I am hoping that there is something positive that Mr. Code can change for the better. And that maybe like with Chris Ectrada, if he continues with this grudge, then hopefully he'll lose access to his entire internet. Like, you know, like get like, like if you see stuff like this happening and um, if you see like more abuse that's just coming from Chris Atrada and stuff like that, just remember, like, just go and report. Try to make reports on social media that this person is being abusive and harmful and acting like a bully. You can do that. So with all that said, I just want to say to everyone, thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, until next time, see you later, dudes.